I uh, want to welcome you to this Friday morning uh, journal club, and I'm really thrilled to have Dr. Johnson Thomas presenting. Um, he is chair of Mercy Endocrinology in Springfield, Missouri, um, and he will be presenting his work on uh, a very interesting and very uh, timely topic. Also, want to welcome Dr. Lisa Orloff, who um, needs no introduction. She has gotten up extremely early out in California uh, to yeah. join us. So thank you, uh, Lisa. Much appreciated. We'll look forward to your comments um, at the end of uh, Dr. Thomas's presentation, if possible. So I think with that, I don't want to uh, take up any more time. Uh, Dr. Thomas, uh, thank you once again, and look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Orkin. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to present our research. So today I will be presenting our uh, research paper that was recently published in uh, Thyroid Journal. And the title of our paper is AIBX, Artificial Intelligence Model to Risk Stratify Thyroid Nodules. I do not have any financial disclosures that are relevant to this research project. So at the end of this presentation, I hope we can discuss the utility of artificial intelligence in classifying thyroid nodules. We'll also discuss the results of our uh, research AIBX image similarity algorithm. As you all know, up to 67% of the patients are in the normal population may have thyroid nodules according to different uh, population studies. But most of them that we find in our clinics are found as incidentalomas. And only about 5 to 10 percentage of them are cancerous. And we are doing millions of biopsies around the world to find this you know, small amount of cancer. Now, when faced with a thyroid nodule, we have multiple options. We can do watchful waiting, we can do biopsy, or we can do surgery. The risk stratification can be done using different stratification algorithms like ATAs, TIRATs, KI TIRATs, or the Rust system. There are a lot of them. And as you all know, they are very subjective. There is inter and intra observer variation, and we cannot classify all nodules with all the available classification systems. For example, an isoechoic or hyperechoic well-defined wider than tall nodule with microcalcification and internal Doppler flow does not really uh, fall into any uh, ATA category, but it could be a follicular cancer or follicular variant of papillary thyroid cancer. In this study, uh, they found by Tang and the Tao, they found out that uh, 16 percentage of the low risk category uh, in the ATA ended up having follicular variant of papillary thyroid cancer, follicular cancer, or heart cell cancer. Because these cancers actually does not have the typical features of papillary thyroid cancer, and it could be misclassified as uh, benign. Another interesting thing is 69% of benign thyroid nodules may have at least one feature suggestive of uh, malignancy. So this is good for... Uh, like to get a good negative predictive value, but this will erode the positive predictive value. And recently, actually last week, there was a new article published in uh, Journal of Endocrine Society, and their conclusion was that ACR tyrides uh, may often be no better than random selection. So as, there's a lot of controversies in using these guidelines, as you can see, and they have very low specificity and positive predictive value. If you uh, use different classification system for the same nodule, you might end up getting different risks. Uh, for example, you know, if you have a hypoechoic solid nodule with irregular margins, that is a high suspicion nodule according to ATA with 70 to 90% probability of malignancy. If you use TIRATS, uh, that will be a category four with about 44 to 72% probability. As you can see, there is not much overlap between these probabilities for the same nodule. So 
Well, you all know the saying, beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. Same is true for margins, microcalcification, and echogenicity. Recently, uh, well, in the last uh, uh, 2019 uh, ATA conference in Chicago, there was a study from uh, Cesar Milstein Hospital in Argentina. They looked at 1,991 patients consecutively and found out that uh, ACR thyroids had a positive predictive value of 3.7% and ATA had a positive predictive value of 4.7%. But when we look at uh, you know, published literature, we see higher values. So that, those are usually from academic institutions, but in real life scenarios, uh, you know, we actually see very low positive predictive value. Uh, so that increases again, um, more surgeries and biopsies. Now let's say we decided to do a biopsy. When we do that, one out of seven nodules, we may not have a definitive diagnosis. It could be non-diagnostic, could come back as indeterminate, or it could come back as suspicious. So to summarize uh, the problem statement, we are doing millions of thyroid biopsies based on very subjective criteria to find thyroid cancer in a very small percentage of population with an invasive technique which may not be diagnostic one out of seven times. Are we improving morbidity and mortality by doing these things? So, you know, we thought about ways to optimize this problem. And uh, what we asked ourselves was that, can we create a reliable, explainable, non-subjective, non-invasive technique to address this uh, problem? So you probably everyone has heard about AI being used in uh, different medical fields, and same is true for uh, thyroid nodules. And recent studies have shown that AI algorithms could match the performance of radiologists in classifying thyroid nodules. And this research was actually published in the uh, American College of Radiology uh, Association's journal. And there are multiple AI algorithms uh, to uh, predict malignancy in thyroid nodules. Some of them use uh, features like thyroids or the ATA criteria to give a diagnosis, but most of them that are based on, that are image based are black boxes. They don't give you a reason why uh, a nodule became benign or malignant other than the ATA or the thyroids classification. So, Going back, I uh, used to uh, do computer programming as in my school days. So when it when AI and machine learning became very popular, we decided to use this uh, to address the thyroid risk stratification problem. And initially, we created something like the ATA thyroid uh, classification, and uh, we presented that research back in 2017 at the ATA conference, and the, the the paper was called Tom score. So you actually put it, uh, put up the uh, different features like micro calcifications uh, or margins and all those things along with the dimensions and it will give you a uh, malignancy score. Then again, that was still subjective. So uh, we decided to uh, abandon uh, that project and move forward with uh, fully image-based uh, algorithms. So this was a retrospective study. So we collected uh, ultrasound images of nodules which underwent uh, either biopsy or surgery from February of 2012 to February of 2017. To be included uh, in the study, uh, these nodules should have had a uh, definitive diagnosis of uh, being it benign or malignant. If the nodule had uh, a diagnosis of Bethesda category one, three, four, or five, it should have undergone surgery to be included in the study. So we had about 400 and we had 482 nodules, and we extracted. 2,025 images uh, from uh, those nodules. 
our text our testing data included uh, data from uh, nodules that either underwent biopsy or surgery from March of 2017 to July of 2018. There were 103 nodules and overall uh, the malignant nodules in the training data set was 66 and in the testing data set was 33. So the training set had 6% subcentimeter nodule, but the testing set actually had uh, all the nodules had at least one dimension greater than one centimeter. 67.6% .6 of the nodules in the training group underwent surgery, and 61% of the nodules in the text testing group underwent surgery. And the prevalence of malignancy in the testing set was 32%. There were 24 papillary thyroid cancers, of which uh, three were follicular variant of papillary thyroid cancer. There were there were three follicular cancer, four heart cell cancers, and one uh, medullary thyroid can two medullary thyroid cancer. So uh, we used a very popular technique in AI called convolutional neural network. So what it involves is we feed that ultrasound image to different convolutional layers. Think of the convolutional layers as each layer extracting one set of features, let's say microcalcification or margins and so on and so forth. And finally, you get a output of whether the you know ultrasound image is a benign nodule or a malignant nodule. So that's usually what happens in an image classification algorithm. You give an ultrasound image and the AI model will tell you whether it's benign or malignant. But it has the problem of you know, explainability. So we decided not to use this end product and use this area, which is the last fully connected layer. And this is very unique for a particular image and you know, it becomes a unique image vector. Think of it as a fingerprint uh, of the thyroid nodule. And what we did was that we, when, when you actually input an ultrasound image to this algorithm, it will create that unique image vector for that nodule and then compare it with the unique image vectors we have stored from our training data set. And we'll try to find the nearest neighbors which are well, which are images which are similar looking to this nodule and try to bring that out. So, you know, without further explaining the whole thing, this is how it works. So you can see a test image here. This is actually from the training data set. This was done just to make sure as a sanity check to make sure that the algorithm is working fine. So when you input this uh, nodule, you will get output of these three nodules. As you can see, the first nodule is the same one as we inputted, so it's picking up the same nodule, and then the rest of them are very similar to the input image. And these are the diagnosis of those, those nodules. Now, the other thing is, you know, people have asked, why don't you just uh, go with a image, uh, you know, classification algorithm? Why do this image similarity algorithm? We actually initially did uh, image classification algorithm. And when the predictions was wrong, it was kind of difficult to understand what went wrong. So here you can see this is a cystic nodule and it was, it was actually a benign nodule and it was called as a benign nodule by the algorithm. And if you look at the heat maps, this is like the areas where the algorithm looked to make sure, I mean, to make that diagnosis. So it's actually looking at the cystic area and the posterior shadowing and identifying it as a cystic benign nodule. So this is very helpful in this image uh, for this nodule, but this was actually a malignant nodule and it was called as benign. But if you look at the actual heat maps, it's kind of pointing around here and I'm not sure why it's doing that. So it's hard to explain uh, those kind of uh, results by using heat maps or class activation maps. So this is another output for uh, the AIBX uh, model. So this is an input image. 
as you can see there is micro calcification it looks it's taller than wider and when you input that you get these three images which also has micro calcification and this is the diagnosis associated with this and the testing physician can actually look at these images and say well these nodules look similar to my nodules so probably they have the same uh, diagnosis or uh, if the images that came up were actually not similar he can look at it and say well it actually doesn't make sense so maybe i should not trust the algorithm so that was the whole reason for doing this now talking about the results we had an accuracy of 81.5 percentage had a sensitivity of 87.8 percentage specificity of 78.5 and had a positive predictive value of 65.9. And the negative predictive value was 93.2. As you all know, the false negative rate for biopsies is usually under 5%, but it can vary anywhere from 1.5 to 11.5%, depending on the study. So we thought any, any um, studies which had an NPV greater than 90% is reasonable good starting point. Now, we also looked at the false negative uh, test results to see if the nodules that were found had any particular diagnosis. Uh, three of them were papillary thyroid cancer, but one was follicular variant of papillary thyroid cancer and one was a cystic papillary thyroid cancer. One of the Hercule cell cancer was actually classified as benign, and based on this, it doesn't seem like the model is favoring one type of malignancy over uh, a different set of malignancy. Now, as you all know, an experienced physician generally evaluates an ultrasound image and arrives at a decision regarding biopsy or surgery based on his or her previous experience and heuristics. We all have a mental picture of how a malignant thyroid nodule should look. And you know we use the same principle in creating this uh, the software, so we try to emulate this by creating an image similarity algorithm, so physician can look at those images and make their own decision. The re another reason for this and not using an image classification algorithm was that predictions uh, from these algorithms could be based on medically irrelevant information. For example. Uh, Dermatologists created an algorithm to predict a malignant melanoma. And what they found out was that if there was a gentian violet surgical marking in the dermoscopic image, the algorithm will automatically call it as a malignant uh, melanoma. Because most of the images in malignant melanoma training data set had gentian violet surgical marking. So it was actually not looking at the malignant melanoma, it was actually looking at the surgical markings to make that. Uh, diagnosis. And in another instance, a self driving car started taking left turns when the sky was a different shade of purple. And the uh, engineers couldn't figure out why this was happening. So they looked at the algorithm and the training data set and found out, what, found out that when this algorithm was being trained, the driver used to take uh, left turns. Uh, when the sky was purple. So that was a small data set in that uh, data. And the algorithm kind of identified that if the sky is purple, I need to turn left. So you, you, you can imagine, you know, what kind of problems that could happen uh, with those kind of scenarios. And there are many examples in the literature showing how this could be a problem in medicine. And another important issue is, uh, different machines, imaging machine, be it ultrasound, CT scans, may have different features uh, when they create images. And that could be a problem in, uh, in, in using a model which was trained on a data set which was created during certain kind of machines and we may not be able to apply it to images that are collected from a different machine. And our algorithm does not use any clinical history. We don't look at radiation exposure, we don't look at family history and any of those things. And none of these algorithms will ever be 100% accurate. Uh, 
the reason being, you all probably know, I mean, there are completely benign looking nodules that will turn out to be malignant on uh, surgery. And there are malignant looking nodules that may actually come back as benign. So using just imaging by itself may not be, uh, you know, be all and end all. So, but it can definitely guide us. Another thing is, even though all the AI uh, imaging systems are supposed to be non-subjective, there is a lot of subjectivity in this. If you think about the ultrasound image of a nodule, there are multiple sections. And let's say there is a complex nodule which has cystic part and some solid part, and there is microcalcification in the solid part. If we select the image with mostly cystic area and give that to the algorithm, it may actually uh, come back as benign. And if you use that other uh, image with microcalcification about the same nodule, it may come back as malignant. So image selection and uh, cropping the image has a lot of implications and many articles does not actually specify how this was done. Um, certainly this can be automated. It has its own advantage and disadvantages. Um, so uh, that's one reason we decided, well, you know, physicians are experts in actually identifying the nodule. Let them select the nodule and uh, run it through the algorithm. So that's why we pr propose something called physician in loop for uh, application of AI uh, in medicine. So what we are envisioning is the endocrinologist, all the ENT surgeon, all the radiologist will select the image uh, that needs to go into uh, the algorithm and the algorithm will give out the diagnosis or the similar images uh, along with the diagnosis for those similar images and the physician can look at it and see whether it makes sense to take that prediction uh, by looking at those similar images. If he thinks that you know the similar images are uh, very identical to the input image, uh, he can accept the diagnosis, or he can look at it and say, "Well, it doesn't match my image. Maybe I should not believe this," and then go ahead and make uh, his own decision. So it's a that's actually a decision support tool. Now, how does this compare to molecular markers? So uh, this was a test. Uh, this was an article. Uh, which compared GEC, the first generation GEC and Thyroseq V2. And they pulled data from 1,086 nodules with histopathologically confirmed diagnosis in uh, with, and which also had GEC, a form of GEC. And as you can see, the positive predictive value of that was 45 percentage and the accuracy was 52 percentage. Uh, had good NPV and sensitivity, but the specificity was only 12 percentage. Uh, same thing with Thyrosic V2, positive predictive value was about 58 percentage, accuracy was 75 percentage, and the specificity was 78 percentage. And you can compare the uh, results of AIBX here, had comparable NPV, but then again, this we are not actually comparing apples to apples. Uh, these tests were done on indeterminate in, uh, nodules and AIBX was done on nodules which were which actually had a definitive diagnosis. So, but this still gives you a perspective uh, of comparing uh, these results with the first generation or second generation molecular markers and how this could play in the future. So, now talking about potential advantages, uh, it's actually very easy to retrain and add more images to an existing database uh, when using uh, image similarity model. Because let's say if we have a uh, nodule and that it was actually a benign nodule and the algorithm called it as malignant, um, then if we put that image back into the testing set in the training set and train it again as a image classification algorithm it may not actually predict it as uh, the right category the next time because you need to have enough amount of nodules with same features for the algorithm to change its output but in an image similarity algorithm if you actually give the same uh, nodule it's going to pick up the same nodule so it's easier to train and you get better uh, results with that. And image similarity is very intuitive and explainable. 
most people can understand, hey, these are similar images, these are the diagnosis. This can also be used to teach residents and fellows. We can pull up uh, nodules with certain features and show it to them from the database. Uh, another potential use in the future will be adding more data to our database regarding mutations and features. For example, we might be able to give out, uh, along with the diagnosis, uh, what was the mutation that was seen in that nodule. Uh, you know, whether what was the surgical pathology, what was the surgical outcome, and stuff like that. Now, the mutation part is very interesting because recently there was a study which looked at ultrasound images to predict uh, BRAF mutations, and their conclusion was that it was not that great at doing that. So, but people are trying to predict mutations uh, from ultrasound images too. Uh, but there was another study which was very interesting. They actually looked at the histopathology slides uh, and they were able to predict BRAF mutations uh, by looking at the thyroid histopathology slides. And the interesting part is that this algorithm was actually not trained on thyroid histopathology. So still it was able to pick up BRAF mutations. Now, what are the potential limitations uh, we need more computing resources and uh, time uh, compared to image classification but usually it's not a significant change our test set only had 103 images so it may not be uh, you know the the results that we got uh, maybe because we had a small data set if we increase the data set it may not show this good of a results and there is always selection bias. We don't uh, go and biopsy all the nodules that come to our clinic and we don't do surgery on all the nodules. So uh, the ones that we do have some features that made us do the biopsy or surgery. So there will be definitely be selection bias. So it cannot be said that this is true for the whole population. The testing set had only made us from our institution so there is no external validation. And most of the time, when AI algorithms are tested on uh, images from different institutions, uh, the performance actually degrades. So this needs to be validated externally. So that's a uh, real concern for us. And you know the prevalence of malignancy in our test set was 32%, which is much higher than what we usually see in our population. But even with that uh, higher amount of uh, prevalence, we actually had a reasonable good uh, negative predictive value. And all nodules in our database did not undergo surgery. So, you know, that's another thing. If we could uh, do it on uh, images that all had surgical pathology, that'd be great. Now, in conclusion, artificial intelligence and thyroid image classification is rapidly evolving uh, it's less subjective but it's definitely not sub you know non-subjective think of it more of a spatial recognition for thyroid nodules for our uh, AIBX it's a reasonable good decision support tool if it's validated with external data there is potential use uh, in indeterminate and uh, non-diagnostic uh, images I mean uh, thyroid nodules now, uh, you know, we talked a lot about it. Let's see uh, if I can show you how this works. Hopefully it works, fingers crossed. So Dr. Camilo uh, uh, sent me three images and he didn't give me the diagnosis. So let's, let's go through uh, this nodule and see what you guys think. So if I look at it, it is more isoechoic or maybe slightly hyperechoic there's some area of hypoechoicity here you can see the margins you know, pretty clearly up to here uh, almost well defined here you cannot see the margin this appears to be more than a millimeter so maybe micro macro calcification and maybe micro calcification i'm not sure whether it falls into any specific uh, ata category uh, but it will be a tyrat four with the moderate suspicion but this could be a benign nodule uh, with, which had undergone a biopsy in the past and had these changes after biopsy so these things are possible 
So let's see if I can uh, pull up the uh, algorithm. Okay. So let me go to the first. Oh, okay. This is the first image Camilo sent me. And let's see. So this is that same nodule. And it's picking up nodules which are malignant here. And as you can see, there is that same kind of calcification inside these nodules. So these are similar images. And according to uh, AIBX, this nodule resembles a malignant nodule in our database. Well, I'm not sure about the actual diagnosis. We'll ask Camilo at the end of the presentation. <laughs> now, let's see. Let's look at one of another image sent by Camilo. Again, this has calcification. This looks malignant to me. And again, it picked up same images here. So it resembles a malignant nodule. We'll do one more from Camilo's images. Again, this also looks malignant. So all three nodules we had from Camilo looked malignant, but you know I had two images from our test set just in case it happens. So I will show you a benign nodule. So as you can see, this nodule is cystic, has colloid in it with reverberation artifact, and it picked up a similar image which has colloid and reverberation artifact. And next. One, this looks more like a cystic nodule again here. And uh, this nodule resembles a benign nodule in our database. So that's this is how this algorithm works. Hope you got a good idea about that. Now let's go back to our presentation. Yes, these are the nodules that Camilo sent us, and all of them came back as malignant. So that's the end of my presentation. We are planning to do a multi-center validation study to see if it is actually any good. So if you're interested in participating, let me know. And that's that's the end of my presentation. If Camilo wants to chime in and actually tell us the diagnosis, that would be great. Yeah, so uh, the first uh, nodule that you showed us is malignant, but came back as a Bethesda 5. Mm -hmm. The second one, we have both uh, FNA biopsy and we have a uh, surgical pathology and it came out as Bethesda 5 again and it was uh, diagnosed as classical papillary thyroid cancer. And the last one that uh, we showed you um, came back as Bethesda 4. Okay, so all of them were malignant or uh, at least suspicious for malignancy in biopsy or surgery. Correct. Great. Thank you, uh, Dr. Thomas, for that fabulous presentation and for your efforts at, at continuing to help us all reduce our uh, over um, intervention on thyroid nodules, our overutilization of uh, biopsies, and um, helping us try to avoid unnecessary surgeries. Um, I uh, uh, applaud the um, uh, use of uh, your clinical knowledge of thyroid um, nodularity and uh, the uh, clinical management of thyroid nodules in informing your approach to um, developing a, an AI algorithm. And um, I think that the uh, as a uh, non-computer linguist, um, I appreciated your presentation in, in uh, helping to uh, uh, put in plain terms uh, what your goals and your methodology were. And I uh, interpret the um, image similarity um, uh, philosophy as um, sort of equivalent to pattern recognition, which when we compare the available risk stratification systems um, in use today that are not artificial intelligence related, uh, we mainly are relying on the ATA system and the TIRAD system. Uh, those are the most widely applied and, and the ones to which you compared your system. And um, I think that the uh, obvious contrast between those two systems is the 
um, sort of familiar pattern recognition figure that we know from the 2015 ATA guidelines, where we uh, similarly seek to compare nodules that we are uh, faced with in person to a series of uh, nodules that are featured pictorially on an atlas or on a, a, a list of um, a, a figure with patterns that are uh, displayed with increasing risk of malignancy based on individual characteristics. Um, the TIRAD system, on the other hand, utilizes the same characteristics, but uh, does so to assign a point system um, that is not so much a pictorial atlas or something that we can individually compare what a nodule in front of us looks like to a nodule in that system, as it does allow us just to assign points for given features that we have to interpret individually and then uh, sum up. So um, your, um, your article in particular made a, a strong case for using an image similarity mod, uh, model um, in preference to um, an image classification system. And I, I really uh, appreciated that as one of the take home points of your of the AIBX system. And um, the demonstration that you just showed us was quite um, uh, powerful. And I think, you know, it just uh, uh, confirms the fact that a picture is worth a thousand words. And um, it appears to me that the, uh, the, the more you can build your training set, uh, the stronger and the more robust this uh, decision uh, support system will become. Um, some of the comparison images that you showed just on that last demonstration were not identical, obviously, to the nodules that Camilo had put together, but um, nevertheless, they performed quite well. And I think as you add more and more images to that training set, you'll have a greater spectrum of uh, nodules to which to compare in a sort of a image similarity fashion. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to see the AIBX in practice and um, I'm excited to hear about the, um, the validation study that you're about to launch. Um, I had prepared some slides that I don't know if you've still not received um, and whether I can uh, show them at all from my computer. Um, they really were more of an attempt to um, step back just a moment from um, the admittedly noble goal of increasing objectivity and decreasing unnecessary interventions um, based on ultrasound interpretation and the operator dependence that goes along with ultrasonography uh, and stepping back from that to actually uh, do what it will obviously show my bias which is that we should at the same time be trying to always improve our ultrasonography um, interpretation so uh, I think the very need for AI is sort of a, uh, a testament to the um, the range of quality of ultrasound that's performed and the uh, the variability in image interpretation and it's very easy to point out that ultrasound is operator dependent but I would just like to emphasize that operator dependence can be a good thing when one demands and expects uh, more uh, insight, more experience, and more effort put into the interpretation of ultrasonography. And the uh, perhaps one of the most um, obvious uh, distinctions in enhancing operator dependence of ultrasonography is the very fact that ultrasonography is a is a dynamic interactive procedure. It's really the imaging modality that involves direct interaction between the examiner and the patient. And the image acquisition is done in a dynamic fashion such that if the interpretation is being done in real time, there is um, invaluable information which is lost when we try to reduce ultrasonography to static images. So one of the shortcomings of um, the AI systems that have been developed thus far, it, it, in my mind, appear to be the input of static images 
through which we're comparing performance um, with uh, uh, human interpretation. And I think that static images um, really don't tell the full story in the way that dynamic or even video clip images do in informing the interpreter. I know we are getting a little shorter on time, so I will sort of skip forward um, through some of these slides. But again, just to sort of reiterate that our overriding goal, uh, whether human or, or AI model, in looking at thyroid nodules is to find the cancer if it's there and to not over-diagnose or uh, over-intervene. And uh, the operator dependence factor is, um, is a constant. But uh, we have here the ACR TIRADS um, system that we're all familiar with that is more of the image classification model that, that Dr. Thomas described. And then the ATA system, which is more of a pattern recognition or image similarity model which I'm interpreting the AIBX to be much more akin to. And yet uh, the fact that they're static images does sort of um, force the, uh, the input to be the selection of representative images that may miss some of the detail and information that's acquired when one's doing a dynamic interactive um, thyroid exam. And uh, then this is just a, a video with a, a sweep through the thyroid showing sometimes the difficulty of determining which nodule is most relevant and which um, um, where one nodule ends and another begins, and even the difficulty in um, doing a simple task such as measuring the dimensions of nodules is not, not always as easy as we try to reduce it to sounding. Um, there's also a limitation in the current risk stratification systems um, in uh, neglecting certain features about nodules, including the location of a nodule within the thyroid, and whether that location is very close to uh, one, the superior pole, inferior pole, isthmus, trachea, esophagus, viscera, you know, anterior or posterior, really does have relevance that I think gets sometimes neglected in the risk stratification systems. And I, I would ask um, you, Dr. Thomas, when you, when you comment, if, if um, there is a, the possibility of building into the, the, uh, the system um, the ability to add information such as the location of a nodule within the thyroid. Then there's, um, you know, I think Dr. Erkin sent another um, publication from, from recent, uh, from last year, from China looking at a variety of AI models and characteristics that we usually rely on to interpret thyroid nodules. And in that study by Zhang et al, um, there was also the inclusion of elastography as a tool that we have continued to try to determine whether it's really value added or is, is something that can help avoid needle biopsy or if it's, it's something that doesn't add as much value as we would like it to. But I think this is just an example of sort of internal elastography that the dynamic ultrasound of a nodule in the posterior thyroid, when the patient swallows, you can see how malleable this nodule is as it rolls over the spine. And although this nodule has some suspicious characteristics, including its um, marked hypoecogenicity, you can see that it's quite a soft nodule that is deformable and that would be sort of equivalent to a very non-stiff or elastic nodule. So then the, uh, the operator dependence factor does allow the uh, dynamic ultrasonographer to incorporate information from beyond the thyroid nodule itself, including the background of the thyroid. This is a, a malignancy on the right side of the thyroid that is a diffuse sclerosing variant of carcinoma that isn't well uh, circumscribed and characterized as a single nodule, but this patient has multiple central compartment lymph node metastases. I'll play this again just to show that there are, are uh, nodules in the central compartment that are lymph node metastases. And then as you descend, here's a lymph node met, more lymph node mets. And then as you descend, you get down to the patient's thymus. And this is just a, a sort of a confirmation that this is a very young patient with a, a very um, still active and non-atrophic thymus. But these are sort of details that one should and could expect 
a, uh, an ultrasound examination and report to convey that add information well beyond the detail of the individual nodule that may itself be hard to characterize. And then going from the central neck, just an example of lateral neck examination in conjunction with thyroid examination to demonstrate the importance of assessing lymph nodes and the fact that even in some microcarcinomas, there can be macro metastases that tell more of the story than the primary tumor does itself. So um, beyond thyroid and lymph node, there's the ability to do maneuvers such as interact with the patient by sonopalpation. As you're doing an ultrasound exam, you can press on a nodule and see if it's infiltrative or in adherent to structures such as the larynx. This was a patient that was sent to me for a total laryngectomy for thyroid cancer when in fact she didn't need a laryngectomy at all. She had a very mobile mass with respect to her larynx even though a CT scan had, had been interpreted as uh, invading the larynx. So this is just a, another example of the, the dynamic nature of, of ultrasonography. And uh, so in the interest of time, I think um, I won't belabor the Zhang article except maybe just to point out that uh, this article looked at a variety of machine learning algorithms um, and came up with the random forest algorithm as the one that performed best in their hands. They did look at the uh, con convolutional neural network, which is what Dr. Thomas used in, in the AIBX and also a nearest neighborhood type of algorithm, which I think, if I'm interpreting correctly, that the AIBX does uh, sort of rely on nearest neighbor for interpretation. And um, again, I'm, I, this is hieroglyphics to me, but uh, these uh, computer algorithms uh, in, in that particular study that you were, um, you were distributed as sort of supplemental information, the uh, random forest uh, algorithm seemed to perform the best. Um, that study also used static images and it excluded nodules in particular locations, which may be the most important nodules actually that we need to be worried about. And so again, it speaks to the limitation of, of um, our risk stratification systems, whether they're human or AI in uh, incorporating information such as location of nodules in the thyroid. And uh, so, so Dr. Thomas's um, AIBX model, I think, is um, really a, a beautiful image similarity algorithm, and I appreciated the explanation of avoiding black box algorithms that do lack explanation of results, um, and therefore don't engender the same level of trust. Um, I think that the AI algorithms, AIBX and otherwise, do attempt to categorize into a binary benign or malignant uh, diagnosis or at least characterization which does help to try to get away from the indeterminate category that we all suffer with and that is sort of the bane of our existence and why we've had to uh, turn to molecular markers which have not delivered as well as we would have hoped in terms of their positive predictive value but uh, I think that uh, some other um, very um, valuable additions to the AIBX model development included Dr. Thomas's incorporation of a variety of ultrasound equipment in order to attempt to maximize the ability to extrapolate this to different practice environments, different uh, uh, equipment resources, and the fact that the physician is in the loop and selects the images to feed to the AIBX. Um, is obviously we none of us wants to feel that we're replaceable so i think uh, having it be a decision support model that allows for our input and our uh, interpretation um, is very uh, welcoming i wanted to ask dr thomas when 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 i yield back the mic um, if you could explain the statement in your article that this could be used to retrieve all available information for a nodule, including diagnosis, molecular markers, treatment received, and spin the current status. In other words, it sounds as if the AIBX could be used uh, in conjunction with knowledge of clinical information that might add to the ability to make an accurate interpretation. And um, I also uh, respect and appreciate the fact that this is very fast, portable, adaptable, can be used in a remote uh, fashion 
and is and used as a teaching tool. So um, not to become too um, uh, focused on the on the details, but I did have some uh, confusion with the math in the publication. And I don't know at this hour if it's really important to go through this. You can perhaps just um, summarize the numbers. But I, when I did the math on the on the training and testing set, I, I had I had difficulty reconciling the numbers of patients in the categories that uh, either did undergo surgery or or didn't. Um, and I would welcome your your comment on that. And I think you admitted the limitations that uh, we're all um, sort of subject to, which include, uh, you know, the numbers that we have available to us. And I think this was a relatively small uh, number in your test set, as you mentioned, but uh, a number that can grow with time, which I think is is uh, the beautiful dynamic aspect of this model. Um, the fact that not all not all nodules were surg surgically excised means that you didn't have histopathology on all, although you do have a very low false negative rate of benign uh, FNA cytology. And uh, again, I just can't overemphasize the importance of dynamic uh, ultrasonography information compared to static images. Um, I did wonder about in inputting the largest dimension of a nodule as opposed to the most suspicious dimension of a nodule. And um, I think uh, I just, uh, I don't want to run out of time and, and pre prevent you from answering some of these questions. So I would just sort of wrap it up by saying that how nodules appear, um, maybe influenced by the, the practice environment, the patient environment, body habitus, thyroid background, that sort of thing. And I think I, I just checked the weather before we got on today and it, it, I heard, it looked like it's raining in both of your cities, but it's sunny in my city today, which um, could influence um, how we look at uh, things. And, and it's similarly, whether a patient has prior radiation or prior surgery or has uh, unadulterated anatomy could change how we look at them. Uh, again, just demanding maximum information from your ultrasound. I just want to part with a, a video showing that in addition to examining the thyroid, and especially in this COVID-19 era when we're trying to avoid invasive procedures, one can use ultrasonography to assess laryngeal function. One can also continue uh, scanning in the, in, throughout the entire central neck to assess for uh, pyramidal lobe involvement, delphium lymph nodes, lingual thyroid, thyroglossal duct cyst. Here's just looking up at the base, uh, at the base of the tongue and showing tongue mobility and the absence of a thyroglossal duct cyst in this particular case. But um, just to, to conclude, um, the dynamic uh, assessment of nodules, I think, far surpasses the static assessment of nodules. And so I look forward to the ability to incorporate dynamic information into future AI models or even the AIBX model. So um, I'll, uh, I'll turn the the mic back over to you, if if that's okay, um, and I thank you for the chance to comment on on your wonderful study and your wonderful work. Um, thank you, Dr. Lisa, Orlando. Thanks. I'm sorry, Lisa. I just one second, Dr. Thomas, because I know there are a lot of people that are going to have a hard stop at nine o'clock. I just want to thank both of you, um, and I'll let people continue. I'll let Dr. Thomas respond. Um, if anybody is interested. Um, or, or wants to share this with any colleagues who were not available. Um, we will be sending out information as we will do every week about the recording of this session that comes online on Monday. Um, and we will be sending you information very shortly about next week's presenters and the topic. And it's our goal to vary the presentations, um, vary the topic. Um, and so next week will be about histopathology um, a very important histopathology um, uh, issue in thyroid cancer. And so with that, again, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Dr. Thomas, do you want to go ahead and uh, comment uh, or respond to Lisa's comments? Sure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Olaf. That was uh, very insightful. And all the things that you mentioned are actually, uh, you know, uh, deficiencies of AI algorithms. So uh, to... Uh, that's one reason we went with the AIBX uh, uh, model. The reason being we still don't want to 
take away i mean i'm a practicing endocrinologist i still want to do my ultrasound and figure out whether there is lymph node whether there is extra thyroid extension so that uh, gives us a lot more information so this is definitely this will never replace uh, that kind of dynamic risk stratification so uh, but in clinical practice what i'm thinking is well he did a biopsy after doing all these things it came back as indeterminate or you know it came back as non-diagnostic then this gives additional information the aibx gives adi additional information now can we use dynamic images in uh, ai algorithms definitely there was a recent publication uh, which used y yolo network which means you only look once and they can actually take the whole video uh, the sign clip and uh, look uh, for nodules and stratify uh, based on that so definitely uh, we can also incorporate video images uh, to uh, algorithms. Uh, now, the other article that you mentioned, Zhang et al., they actually did not use the actual ultrasound image. They extracted the features, just like you and me, will look at an ultrasound image and say, well, this has microcalcification, this has uh, uh, you know, irregular margins, and put that data in a text format into those algorithms. And they also use CNN, but they used it in a different way. And that's kind of what we did back in 2017. And that is still very subjective. So that's why we decided not to uh, uh, go in that direction. Even though it looks like they use a lot of algorithms, it's actually pretty easy uh, to use all those algorithms uh, and you might get different results with that. But, but the main takeaway from that is they actually did not use that image per se it was their interpretation going into uh, as a database, like a textual database, and the output came from that. So uh, that's one reason uh, it's still very subjective. Now, uh, to answer the, the other question, how can we get other information uh, like the mutation? For example, if we have uh, what AIBX does is it finds a unique vector uh, for that uh, nodule and then goes to our database and picks up uh, nodules that are similar. So we can actually store uh, all kind of information about a nodule, like whether it had surgery, what was the molecular markers. So all those things, just pulling it out uh, is pretty easy as long as we have that database. And uh, so um, if you are able to put that in, it's, it's pretty easy to pull it out. Regarding the discrepancy in the numbers, the 1.7 percentage was actually uh, like the experience in our institution as a whole. So when we did internal validation, one time we had to um, look and see what was our non-diagnostic rate and everything. So that came from that. And uh, the reviewers had the same comments. So we hashed it out uh, during the review process, but I'd be happy to uh, send those results if you actually email it to me. I'll, I'd be happy to discuss that over the email. But uh, the points that you raised are, you know, they are uh, spot on, and there are a lot of limitations to these AI algorithms. And I don't think it will ever replace the dynamic risk stratification. But the the point is, not everyone has expertise in ultrasound, and uh, you know, sometimes we are left with uh, static images when patients bring in this if we don't have the ability to do this, and you know we get indeterminate and non-diagnostic results after we do all the stratification and do a biopsy. And especially in a non-diagnostic patient, if you do two and it comes back as non-diagnostic, this is kind of another tool to reassure you or you know, in, the cert in a certain direction, if I may. Uh, so those are the areas that I see, uh, especially in non-experienced uh, you know, uh, people who are using this to get more information in non-diagnostic and indeterminate models. I hope that clears uh, most of the questions, but I'll be happy to uh, you know, chat online or uh, you know, cross phone through email. And if anyone is interested in collaborating, as I said, this looks good on paper. That doesn't mean that it will work well in other institutions. So that's, that's the reason we are doing a uh, external validation study. I have one quick question, and um, uh, and then unfortunately I've got to sign off here. Is um, Dr. Thomas is more information better? Um, 
for the system, um, meaning the more variables and the more um, uh, real life um, uh, cases that you include, especially in, in uh, situations where there are false um, positives, false negatives, does that enhance um, the system? Do you expect that that's going to improve um, the, uh, uh, the accuracy of your model? That's a good question. Uh, but if you look at the ATA risk classification, there are only a few uh, pictures, and we are comparing our pictures to them in our, you know, in our mind. So for a made similarity algorithm to work, if we have enough samples of representative, you know, images or nodules or certain diagnosis, that is enough. We should be able to find similar images, but always more data is better. And I also want to make one point, you know. Uh, if the AI algorithms can actually see more things in the picture that we are not able to see, and we can use different filters and stuff to actually make it forward, but that's one disadvantage of using real-time, um, you know, ultrasound too, because they call it the radiomics feature, so that are really hard to actually see with our eyes, but the algorithm can pick it up, maybe difference in texture, which our eyes are not able to uh, identify. And adding those extra uh, information and more nodules, I think definitely will make it better. But from a image similarity perspective, if we have representative images of certain pathology, then it should work well. And the last question was whether it will improve the negative predictive, uh, the uh, false negative um, uh, results. I hope it does, but uh, hopefully we can learn more from the uh, external validation uh, study. Great, thank you. So, I just want to thank you, Dr. Thomas, for your re your responses. And what I'm um, sort of concluding means that the, I, I think the the goal in the future will lie in a combination of expertise in in human ultrasonography and the the use of artificial intelligence and models such as yours to really help us refine our interpretation and, and, and input the most important of those, um, of those factors and of the, uh, of, of the images, you know, based on our own knowledge. I, I think the, the partnership between computer and, and human sounds like it's going to be the way forward. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining everybody. Thank you all very much. Have a nice day. You too.